So if technically you have a transgender woman, a biological male, and still a male, but identifies as a woman, but you have a godfather, a, a true biological male, who is super practicing his Catholic faith. There is no reason why that child can't be baptized. Welcome to the Father Leo Show, where we're dishing out faith, culture, and commentary. And this week, we're going to be entering into a deeper discussion about the trans movement, the trans debate, the trans conversation, because it's going nowhere very quickly. And what we've got to do is enter more deeply into the conversation, as it does affect our own consciousness. It affects certainly our culture, and it's definitely affecting our church. So let's get into it with our segment as we talk about our faith. Yes, we certainly do need our faith, but faith in exactly what is the question? Well, let me just say that I was invited recently to participate in a, in a little dialogue on Newsmax. And I know that this is coming a few weeks later this whole idea of the Catholic Church allowing trans people to be baptized and even allowing godparents who might identify as trans to actually serve as godparents. So I was invited on the news and, uh, and I was in a little discussion and I got to say that, well, we'll talk about it after we watch it. So here we go. It's a very confusing document, Sean, because they're saying that they have to live under the conditions that all the faithful have to do. But if, you're, if you claim to be a transgender person, that means you're not content with the way you were born. You, if you're a male, you think you're a female or vice versa. That goes against God's providence and the nature of creation. Male and female, he created them. So as Father Leo said, if they're going to repent, and therefore they need to renounce the pretense that they're not the sex they were born as, that's not a problem. The problem would arise if a man dresses up like a woman and then comes to church and says, I want to be baptized, and then I want you to call me Mrs. I want you to call me Miss. And we'll say, well, you're not a Miss or, or Mrs. You're, you're a man. What does this also mean for the role of a godparent? How does that play into This it? is even more troubling in some way because a godparent is supposed to model Christian life. <clears throat> excuse me, for the person who is the, uh, uh, the godchild. How can you model Christian life if you're pretending to be what you're not? And that's really something. What we're doing is providing an opportunity for anyone who wants to be affiliated to the Catholic Church, either as a baptized member or as a godparent, they have to make sure that they can conform their life to Christ. And as the Holy Father said, the baptism and the opportunity to work with the church gives them a grace to receive the other sacraments, including the sacrament of repentance. And so this is definitely a challenging conversation to have, but if someone is willing to have it, especially the parents who are gonna select godparents, they gotta make sure that they are going to live according to the church's teachings and fulfill their obligation to raise that child in faith. And so it is a challenging one, but you know what? The church is going to be willing to have this because the grace is available to all who seek it. Well, you know, when we look at this debate, I looked at the comments. I should never look at the comments, to be honest with you. They were ugly. To be honest with you, they were just ugly. They had saying, like, Father Murray is the only priest up there who was actually making any sense. And you were just like, oh, whatever, this is just a normal document. No, I was not doing a just whatever. I think what we've got to do, especially in this segment of the Father Leo show, when we're kind of talking about faith, is to actually understand the faith of the Catholic Church in regards to baptism, the sacramental requirements for baptism. So let's get into it because I think people just wanted me to take a position and take a side. When in fact, what I was trying to do was take the side of the Catholic Church. And yeah, this is gonna be challenging. There is no doubt about it. This is challenging for everyone, but especially in a unique way for the church because we're the only ones really upholding the truth of the identity that we have in Christ Jesus as assigned to us by birth. But what I was talking about was the responsibility that we need to place on the parents and the godparents and yes, us priests, us ordinary ministers of this sacraments. So what I wanna do is just kind of 
outline a little bit here of what the church teaches because I've had some very unique experiences. I've been a priest almost 25 years, ordained in 1999, and even before that as a deacon ordained in 1998, I was doing baptisms. And my first baptism ever, I got a phone call like the day after the baptism. And this man was screaming at me and he was basically threatening to sue me because he said, I baptized this child without his permission and that he claimed that this child was Jewish and now I'm gonna get sued. Dude, I'm a deacon. I was just ordained and now I'm getting sued for technically, he said that I was gonna get sued for baptizing his child. And I'm going to tell you something. I had to explain to him that number one, while you, the Jewish father, were not there, all of the prescriptions for a sacramental baptism to occur were present. There was a mother who was practicing her faith, as well as a godmother and godfather who were practicing their Catholic faith. And I had to explain that to the man that he can continue to raise his child Jewish, but now that this baby also has the grace of the baptismal promise of Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church. Well, clearly, he and his wife were not in a position that to even talk about faith because they were not necessarily in a faithful relationship with each other. And I had to explain to him again that anyone can be baptized. In fact, that's what the Catholic Church teaches. Every person, this is Catechism, uh, Canon Law 864, every person not yet baptized, and only such a person is capable of baptism. In other words, if you already baptize, like if you're a Catholic and you say, leave the Catholic Church for whatever reason you want to do that. We can talk about that another time. But if you leave the Catholic Church and go to like, I don't know, a non-denominational church where they're doing baptisms in a pool, you technically can't receive that because you are already baptized. We accept the baptism of every Christian, no matter what. And so anyone who is not baptized is a candidate to receive the sacrament of baptism. And the Catechism is also clear, and it says this in Catechism 1255, for the grace of baptism to unfold, which means it's the beginning of the mystery. It's the sacrament of initiation. In order for the grace of baptism to unfold, the parent's help is important. So to, doesn't say necessary. It's important because technically you don't even have to have parents to be baptized, like a baby who might be raised by their grandparents. The parents might not be involved for whatever reason. That kid can still be baptized. It says, so too is the role of the godfather and godmother who must be firm believers, able and ready to help the newly baptized, the child or an adult, on the road to Christian life. Their task as godparents is a truly ecclesiastical function, and they actually put the Latin term in officium, officium. It's an office. The whole ecclesial community bears some responsibility for the development and the safeguarding of the grace given at baptism. In other words, you don't even have to have parents be present. While it's nice, all you have to have is just one person, one person, to serve as a godparent. Now, if it's a good Christian, they can't be a godparent, they can be a Christian witness. You need to have one person who is truly practicing their faith. So if technically you have a transgender woman, a biological male, and still a male, but identifies as a woman, but you have a godfather, a, a true biological male, who is super practicing his Catholic faith. There is no reason why that child can't be baptized. So, and I guess the question that people ask is, but what about, and this is to the point of the other priest, and he, he raised a very good point. It is a confusing document, but it's not a document that redefines our dogma. This is key because our dogmas can't be changed, that the teachings of the church can't be changed, but it is certainly 
a question that people are asking because everyone's asking it. And, and therefore, what we've got to do is go back to what we believe. What is our faith as it relates to a transgender person? And while I am certainly in the position that says, no, you can't do it. Could there be a reason why a transgender person does serve as a godparent? Well, let's look at what the, the canon law of the church talks about in the role of godparent. It begins with canon 872. And it's a little bit of a lengthier section, so I'm going to read and try to hopefully explain it so that you know that me saying, uh, you know, it's a challenging document, it is a challenging document. By the way, what I should have said at the end of that conversation was a quote attributed to Oscar Wilde, but it's certainly true for everyone who believes in their faith, in the Catholic faith. It says, every, every saint had a past. Every sinner has a future. So that's just a key thing to remember when it comes to the sacraments. None of us are worthy to receive it. And none of us are truly worthy, like I'm not worthy to administer it. And I can tell you that humble godparents are not worthy to be godparents. That's just all there is to it. So we're all sinners, but there is hope for us. And I think this document, as confusing as it might be to those who want to politicize it, need to look more deeply into what the document is trying to suggest and not just simply put it into a political leftist camp, but say, okay, if I believe in the papacy, which I do, I have to approach this more humbly, not as a know-it-all, but as someone who needs to learn more. What is God trying to teach me? So, Let's get into can Canon Law 872. Insofar as possible, a person to be baptized, to be given a sponsor who assists an adult in Christian initiation or together with the parents present at an infant baptism. A sponsor also helps the baptized person to lead a Christian life in keeping with the baptism and to fulfill faithfully the obligations inherent to it. In other words, that's true for anyone, no matter how they identify, because just because a person might be experiencing gender dysphoria doesn't mean that they can't be struggling to try to live according to the faith. Canon 873. There is to be only one male sponsor and one female sponsor or just one of each. So I don't need to have a godmother and a godfather. I can just simply do with one. Just one. That's fine. Now, can a transgender person serve as a Christian witness? Here's where it just gets a little interesting, and I'm just going to explain this because it's hard to not explain it. I was um, I was uh, in the Philippines, and my family, we were traveling, and we happened to have a tour guide. The person's name was Jasper. Jasper was a man, but he identified as a woman. And I got to tell you, like as a man, he would just be a sissy. He would just, I mean, that's how he would, he would just qualify as a sissy. He was very effeminate. And he, he was kind of like in this between, he wasn't fully transitioned as a woman. He didn't have any surgery. He was just what, what in the past, they would just call them transvestites. You know, they dressed as women. And I got to tell you, as Creepy and as uncomfortable it was. I was ordained a priest maybe 10 years at the time, so I was still pretty zealous. I still think I'm pretty zealous now, but I can tell you, Jasper, Jasper prayed with us, went to Mass. I, I, I have no reason to believe that, yeah, Jasper does suffer identity confusion, and that's inherently sinful, but doesn't mean that it's necessarily a sin. There's a difference between you know, a temptation is sinful. You act on it. That's the sin. The temptation itself is just there. Someone's confusion can lead to sin, but it's not necessarily a sin that prevents them. So I'm just basically here to say that Jasper prayed the rosary with us, went to adoration. Uh, Jasper was incredibly kind, virtuous, and patient. My God, I had to deal with my crazy family for the entire two weeks in the Philippines. So patient. Had more virtue than I did when it came to patience. Could Jasper be a Christian witness, witnessing to the virtue of Christ? Perhaps because the sufferings of Christ was present in her, her broke, and excuse me, in him, 
see, it was so confusing because it was like I saw him as her because that's just how it came across. But is it possible? Yeah. To be a Christian witness, to be permitted, Canon 874, to be permitted to take on the function of sponsor, a person must, one, be designated by the one to be baptized by the parents or the person who takes their place or in their absence by the pastor or minister and have the aptitude and intention of fulfilling his function. And you know what this means? It requires parents to make sure they're actually choosing right people. So this document puts pressure on the church, but you know what else puts pressure on? On the parents to make sure that they're actually doing their job and raising that child in faith. To be a Catholic who has been confirmed and has already received the most holy sacraments of the Eucharist, which again presumes that they've also been to confession, and who leads a life of faith in keeping with the function to be taken on. In other words, they say what they believe and they do what they say, not be bound by any canonical penalty, legitimately imposed or declared. That just means that they can't be, I don't know, like, they, they can't have been excommunicated. Let's put it that way. Not be the father or the mother of the one be baptized. In other words, parents can't be the godparents. A baptized person who belongs to a non-Catholic ecclesial community is not to participate except together with a Catholic sponsor and then only be considered uh, a Christian witness. So you can see that my position was simply the Catholic Church's position. And yeah, uh, Monsignor Gerald was simply raising the fact that this is a difficult document. But guess what? Every baptism that I did preparation for was challenging because there was an issue in almost every set of family circumstances that came to me for baptism. Hope you're enjoying this episode and we want to make sure that you are truly experiencing what these episodes are trying to do save you and your family and that's why i wrote the book saving the family which is basically tapping into the power of food helping you to become the supper hero because truly your family is saved around the dinner table where we can continue the conversations that is dishing out culture faith and your informed commentary so you can get the book saving the family at platinggrace.com and now back to the father leo show either parents weren't practicing the face there was going to be some issue that they were going to be encountering i mean there was just very far and few between where i just knew that everyone that was going to be there was on the same page not everyone's on the same page this document is trying to get us all on the same page that there can't be confusion. If there is, they have to be repentant of it. And so that's what I have to say when it comes to faith. I don't want to put faith in that document. I want to put faith in what the Catholic Church teaches. So that's what I have to say about the trans reality and how it affects our church. Now, how does the trans debate affect our culture? Well, here we go. I want to take a look at this. This is uh, another kind of post that I've seen, and it's kind of interesting because it really talks about what places like California, how they approach the trans debate. For me, as a Catholic priest, I, I don't think that this show is even going to cover all of the details that are necessary, but I can say this. It does require a deeper conversation on the grassroots level, not a conversation when it comes to like the way Governor Newsom is approaching it because he is pushing it like this. Starting in 2024, August will be recognized as Transgender History Month. The legislation cites California's long ranging significance in trans history, starting with Spanish colonizers, suppression of gender variants. What? With the addition exactly. of Transgender History Month, we now have literally 180 days dedicated to the LGBTQ plus community, including but not limited to Aromatic Spectrum Awareness Week, Agender Pride Day, Pansexual and Panromantic Awareness Day, and the entire month of June for Pride Month. I mean, that, that is just the exact opposite of what the Catholic Church is doing. Culture is being destroyed by a lack of an ethical, systematic, 
serious conversation about the trans community. I know for a fact that many people who identify or who are gay or lesbian can't stand the trans movement because it goes against the very being of what it means to be gay or a lesbian. And what's frustrating to me is that this one topic, it's almost like a light switch turned on and it all just came out of the woodworks. Now, does that mean that, uh, that there weren't trans people prior? Okay, no, again, remember, when I was a 10-year ordained priest, I, I knew one. Uh, when I was younger, I, I'll say this as well. God, it's a lot of divulging I'm doing here, ladies and gentlemen. When I was younger, my mom was Mrs. Philippines. She's a beautiful woman. It was an honorary title. She was Mrs. Philippines of the nation's capital. And as such, she would travel around America as well as the Philippines and act as an ambassadress of goodwill, doing a lot of work to support poor people, particularly Filipinos in the Philippines. Part of her kind of requirement was to look beautiful and to look good. That's why she had someone who always kind of took care of her hair, dressed her, put on her makeup. It was a courtier, you know, courtier, whatever they're called. And he was a gay man. His name was Emmanuel. Interestingly enough, God is with us. And Manny was incredibly effeminate. He did put on makeup. He still identified as a man, but he was very gay. I bring this up because even when I was younger, I had been kind of, I, I'd seen this, not as an influence to me necessarily, but an influence in that I didn't disrespect him. I was taught by my parents to respect him. My parents never said anything about his sexual proclivities or, or his, his desires. And none of that actually ever came out in conversations. He was just there doing his job and he was gay. He was tray gay. And, but he was kind. When my parents were out and he had to babysit us, well, not us, but like I was still a teenager, but he would be in charge of watching us and cooking for us. He actually led the rosary for us. A gay man leading the rosary. Is it possible? Well, yes. And I say this simply because it's the exact opposite. He, we celebrated his goodness. We didn't celebrate his gayness or his trans potentiality. What California has done is they simply are just trying to affect culture with laws, no matter how immoral they might be. And they are immoral because it's a celebration of confusion. Now, this is different from a gay pride. That has turned into a moral decadence for sure. But early on, I was talking to a, a man who, again, identifies as gay. He basically told me that, you know, when he marched in the first gay pride parade, it was just to let people know you shouldn't beat us up. That's kind of, I remember him saying that and it kind of struck me and I thought, okay, yeah, you shouldn't get beat up because you're gay. It doesn't mean that you need to be celebrated, but you certainly don't need to be beaten up over it. These days, we're having celebrations for the oddest things that they claim they had no choice in the matter. So in their dysfunction, we celebrate it. But while there's a 180 days to celebrate this, there's only a few days where we actually celebrate, I don't know, veterans who actually made a choice to sacrifice themselves to a degree in order to give us the freedom so that they can walk around the streets and not get beat up. So you can see the culture is being absolutely confused and annihilated because of these incredibly unthoughtful and incredibly biased laws and ultimately meaningless laws. So please don't think that the Catholic Church is doing that with the document that I previously kind of mentioned. If there's anything that we need to be outraged about is stuff like this, where they're just trying to codify confusion and celebrate it. So it's a real, it's a real it's a real problem for culture because people in culture aren't actually critically thinking anymore. We need to do a better job 
of that. And that's my that's my talking points when it comes to the trans conversation and culture. And now time for my commentary. What do you bring to lunch with the Pope? I'm bringing chicken empanada. I got up at 3 a.m. to cook them, and they're still hot. Pope Francis invited more than a thousand people to lunch on the Catholic Church's World Day of the Poor. World Day of the Poor. The guests included transgender women from a seaside parish an hour south of Rome. They've received help from their local church since the onset of the COVID pandemic. From that moment, Father Andrea always helped us. He opened the door. He brought us food. From there, our friendship was born. Now, this is key because this story came out around the same time that the conversation about trans baptism and godparents came out, and it led to just a firestorm in the media. This is my commentary. A lot of people got on my social media and just started to ask me, what do you think of this? You know, like your radio silent. You must support all that. Come on. I don't respond to everything instantly because that's the worst kind of commentary. That's called a reaction. That's not a response. A proper response is actually going to sit back, kind of let the dust settle, and then you start picking up the pieces systematically and as rationally as you possibly can. And in this case, I see no problem with this. It is in how it was spun to make it look like the church is just turning into a big gay trans community. And in a way, we are. We're all about transubstantiation, the change of our substance. You see, these are not, uh, this was not a luncheon with trans people. It was a luncheon for poor people for people who were hungry, people who were homeless, for the poor. Shouldn't the Pope eat with them? And in that community, did not Jesus also eat with prostitutes? So from my commentary point of view, I see no problem with this story because the Holy Father is simply trying to do something that Jesus did. And yeah, it got the ire up of people who really believe in God. And I certainly believe in God. And when I first saw it, I was pretty frustrated and annoyed too. I was really frustrated and annoyed. But then again, a good reaction is one that is responsible, where you pull back, you kind of let the dust settle, you pray about it, and then you actually do some investigation and realize that this wasn't a celebration of trans people. It was just the news making it all about that. It was a small bus compared to the thousands of people that were poor. And I guarantee you that those poor people had just as many problems as those men identifying as women in their confusion. What is this telling me? Well, we just need more conversation that's gonna respect the reality of what our faith teaches as a formation of culture, not the other way around. Culture should not inform the church. We can learn how to present our faith to culture a little bit better by just simply paying attention and making sure we're not simply just jumping into every conversation possible. So while I respect everyone who kind of jumped on immediately and started talking about these conversations, I do think from a priest's point of view, there were a lot of lay people who jumped on and they became kind of authoritarians when in fact, they're not the ordinary ministers of the baptismal sacrament and they don't always deal with the frontline issues that we priests have to deal with in being pastoral and trying to get access to the grace of the sacrament, the initiatory sacrament of baptism. And so I know that this is going to get people going and I'm probably going to get a lot of hate mail and say, you know what, you just need to be less wishy-washy. I am being completely clear. I am following what the church teaches. And even though, and even though I might not like all of the examples that I'm seeing and how Holy Father is, you know, seemingly welcoming all these people, I've got to humble myself and actually ask, what is Jesus trying to tell me in all of this? Hmm. That's my commentary. What is Jesus trying to tell me in all of this? Because I said it before, every saint had a past. Every sinner has a future. 
I want you to thank you for being part of this show, The Father Leo Show, where we're dishing out faith, culture, and commentary. Please make sure that you click subscribe to our channel. We're trying to grow it as best as we can, as well as our Patreon community, where in the coming months, we're going to roll out even more perks for all of those who are supporters of The Father Leo Show. It's the only way we can continue to do what we do. So God bless you. Thank you for watching and stay hungry for God.